Welcome to Adeva Insights. Uh, we have uh, Tari Chanakov talking about technical debt, the king this time of engineering efficiency. Uh, Tari Chanakov, the floor is yours. So while I was preparing for the talk, I thought of taking another perspective than the blog post that is already out uh, there and uh, hopefully everyone that joined the meeting now had time to read it. But I will still start with a part of the post, which is the metaphor, uh, what Cunningham used uh, to explain what technical debt is. He compares technical debt with financial debt, which is a very good and on point example. We need money now, we can get it through a bank loan, but based on that, we will need to pay interest. So the point uh, that I want to focus the most today is for paying the monthly fee to the bank on time. Because we know that if we lose control or like if we like miss one payment, then the bank will come after what is theirs. So in terms of technical debt, this can be compared to the maintaining phase. So let me throw a disclaimer before I even start. Uh, as being part of many projects so far, I haven't had a chance to uh, minimize the technical debt to zero. So unlike the uh, unlike the the loan that we get from the bank, which fortunately we can uh, pay completely off with technical debt, I don't I don't think that it's a real uh, scenario where we can reduce it to zero, but we can still minimize it and taking uh, good steps, we can keep maintaining it so it won't grow. Because once we let it grow, that's when we start having issues and it might get out of control and it will prevent us from moving uh, forward. So that's what ne the next um, uh, quote says. Uh, so Sandro Macuso uh, says that the technical debt is anything preventing you from developing fast. So based on this, we might say that, I mean, I did. I pushed the feature very fast and it, it really works great. It does until it stops and until we need to extend it or a customer reports an issue. Then, then it might be a blocker. So I think that we have a better picture now on what technical debt is, but let's dive deep into more details. One might ask, is bad code technical debt? No, bad code is just bad code. We also very often uh, confuse technical debt with uh, cognitive debt. And cognitive debt is when there is a code that you don't understand well enough to make changes to it. So let's be clear, the code that we don't understand works and we have no issues with it but we just don't understand it well enough in order to start making changes to it. And as long as we don't need to fix any issues regarding that part of the application or any uh, feature is uh, uh, required by us, then that part of the app cannot be classified as technical depth. That's just cognitive depth. So I will uh, try to recognize three categories out of uh, technical depth. And I would like to share some more details for each one of those. The first one being unavoidable, unavoidable depth. So we love using frameworks, using lots of libraries. They, they allow us to develop and get to market faster, but it all has its own uh, consequences. Laravel, for example, has a six month release cycle, which is both good and bad. It is good because if you keep your project up to date, you will get the latest and greatest always. But it will be bad and it, will, it might start to, to bite us uh, off if we don't keep our projects up to date. Same with libraries. In the PHP world, for example, we have libraries for every single thing, even a lot of one-liner libra libraries. So a couple of ways to maintain this type of depth would be to schedule a time slot every month to update your project and its dependencies. Or when it comes down to using a library, take a look on what that library offers and what do you need out of the library. If it is just part of the library that you need, maybe a better approach would be to just extract and reuse that part instead of pulling the whole library in. And then try to couple, couple your code to it because if it so happens that they release a newer version uh, of the library to fix an issue that the maintainer had or I don't know, they, they started supporting a, a, an upgraded version of the programming language that you're using, but you don't intend to upgrade your uh, your version, and you and you accidentally pull out the the the, the latest uh, library, it might bite you off. So it might uh, start producing some some errors on, on your part. Then you will need to spend time to to, re to rework that part of your application, which again will uh, slowly uh, slow uh, slow you down. 
The second one is uh, plan depth. And I think that uh, Kate in her talk uh, about um, the time-driven development had a good example on this. Maybe the intention wasn't plan depth per se, but refactoring part of the application to use repository pattern in case someday in the future you might need to add an additional service, which just so happened that it was never used, it's okay to leave it as it is. Let's remember that technical depth is something that prevents you to develop faster, as Sandra Mancuso said. So in case we don't need to extend, you know, we have foreseeable plans for additions to a feature that we are currently working on, it is okay to not support everything that might uh, pop up into our mind uh, at that moment. So we might never need to extend it. So over-engineering or overthinking something again will slow us down. And the third one, and the one that I want to focus the most is the unintentional depth. This depth is like when uh, both the client does not know where he's heading with the software that wants to be developed, and the developer is just there listening to the client with no way to know which questions to ask. So here, I would like to share a story for a project that I'm actively working on for one of my clients. They're accountants, and so we work on accounting software. They used to have a software that kind of worked, but it was not a scalable solution, and it was using very old technologies. So when we first started, and uh, we agreed on starting from, from scratch and just reusing uh, some of the functionalities or ideas that they had uh, and were implemented the old product. So at the very first, uh, we needed to, to have a way to add invoices and forecasts and into the system and generate some basic reports out of those documents. Then they would export the reports into Excel file and do the same with bank transactions out of the, the bank software and populate the cells in the Excel sheet in order to make the real reports that they, that they and their clients needed at the end. So I asked them, why don't we import those Excel files uh, from the bank and do the matching of the transactions with the invoices in our software? That way we can make other reports or whatever else, uh, whatever else is needed. So, so we started doing that and you get the idea on where this waterfall approach is heading. So we had to generate one report and then another, then it turned out that the transaction from the bank can be separated into multiple invoices and vice versa. One invoice can be paid using multiple transactions. And so I did port on, uh, on that, but then the calculation in the reports would need to reflect on those changes because um, like one, the, the main report, let's say, had to, uh, um, the calculation was uh, off because of some sub invoices that, that we were using. Then, so I thought that like, the fastest way to, to resolve this issue is directly, directly to, uh, to modify that, that report that was generated and, and apply the calculation only on that, on that report. But once we started having the issues popping up in, uh, in another part of the application and having different totals between the reports, that's when I recognized that, okay, so we are starting to, to, to have a bit of a, a, a technical depth, which if we keep going on, uh, if a new report comes in, let's say uh, in, in the near future, then I will have more trouble and more problems if, if let's say in the future we needed to add an additional thing. So I will have to maintain uh, each part of the application separately. So uh, that, that's the way that unintentional depth uh, kept growing and growing and slowly could have went out of control. So I thought, should I ask them to rewrite my application in order to reduce the technical debt? Hmm. So asking my client to still pay me while I don't produce anything new, but just fix the leftovers and the technical debt that I, uh, that I accumulated didn't sound good to me. And I doubt that it would have sounded okay to my client. So since I, I knew that my client was working four days per week, I thought for start, I will tell them that the day when they are off, I will spend time to improve the application and start reducing the technical depth to a maintainable phase so we can move forward with new features faster. That sounded good to them as I hope so. So that's what we did. So all of this uh, being said, we might ask how does all of this applies to a team? It really uh, depends on the size of the team, but uh, good steps to be taken are good code review maybe pair programming as well. But 
schedule time for discussions. For example, if the team works in sprints, then having a slot uh, on discussing if someone from the team recognizes part of the application that can be improved or blocks future extensions would be a really good start. And yeah, all of this being said, we, we can just take out from all uh, the whole uh, talk today that the communication is the key. So in a team, the communication with the whole team, uh, schedule time to, to improve the application and also uh, an open conversation every every sprint, if, if not every sprint, let's say once a month, at least it will be a good start. And in a solo project, communication with the client, even if the client is you yourself. 